So that brings us on to the third and final part of the lecture. So the objective of this part is to calculate flight time and range for a rocket that could be used for delivery of aerosol forming substances to the stratosphere. So this part of the lecture is going to be done by means of an example. Please have a look at example 7 on your sheets. So here we're told that we've got a rocket that flies in two stages. During the first stage of the, of the flight, the rocket engine provides a thrust for 50 seconds before running out of fuel. And then there's a second stage of flight during which the rocket coasts to its final altitude. Given some information about the rocket engine, it has a specific impulse of 2,000 meters per second. So we saw in the last part of the lecture that that's definitely feasible. Um, it provides a thrust of 300 kilonewtons. About the mass of the rocket, we're told the mass of the rocket without the propellant is 13,500 kilograms, and that includes 7,500 kilograms of sulfur dioxide that we're trying to deliver to the stratosphere. The rocket has a frontal area of 1.7 square meters and a drag coefficient of 0.55. And the air density is given to us a constant or a separate constant for each of the stages of flight. So in actual fact, air density decreases as we increase in altitude. But to simplify the calculation, we're told that over the first stage of the flight, we could take it as constant of 0.6 kilogram per cubic meter. And during the second stage, 0.3 kilograms per cubic meter. So what are we asked to find out? We've got to find out the mass flow and mass repellent needed, and thus the mean mass of the rocket. We're going to find out the velocity and altitude reached after the first stage of flight, and thus find out the final altitude reached by this rocket. So the approach is as follows. The first thing to do is to calculate the net upward force of the rocket. So that's going to be the thrust. It's equal to the thrust minus the weight of the rocket minus the drag term. Now during the first stage of the flight, uh, we'll apply a simple differential equation which you can integrate uh, to get velocity as a function of time. Okay, so um, as I said, uh, we're going to take mass to be roughly constant. Okay, so we're going to use a mean value of mass. Otherwise, uh, the equation will be difficult to uh, integrate because we'd have a variable term in, it wouldn't be able to separate the variables in the equation. So that's why we're using the approximation of a constant mean mass. Once we've got the velocity, we can integrate that with respect to time. Uh, we'll go through this in the tutorial to get the distance traveled. Then during the second stage of the flight, this is very similar to what we did in the artillery questions. Uh, we use a slightly different form of Newton's second law. V times dV dot dS equals um, the force divided by the mass. And here, the net force is entirely downwards because there's no thrust. The rockets run out of fuel. So we've got the weight and the drag terms only. Okay, so as I said, we'll go through this uh, in the tutorial. Um, but these are the results that we obtained from this calculation. We've worked out, after the first stage, a final velocity of 348 meters per second, and the rocket has reached an altitude of 9,119 meters. Then the second stage of the flight enables the rocket to travel a further 5,795 meters, thus reaching a final altitude of 14,914 meters. That is a, a stratospheric height because the stratosphere begins at roughly 10 to 15 kilometers. Uh, that, so that's just above the troposphere. Uh, the, tro uh, the actual height where it starts um, it depends on uh, where you are uh, in, in, on the Earth's um, surface. It, it, the, the, the troposphere is thicker towards the equator, but 15,000. Uh, meters or 15 kilometers is certainly getting us up into the stratosphere. And so what I've really uh, demonstrated with this uh, worked example, this simple worked example, is that we could lift uh, seven and a half tons of sulfur dioxide using just seven and a half tons of fuel. So roughly an equal quantity of fuel to sulfur dioxide, sulfur dioxide uh, lifted. So that's quite a promising ratio 
bearing in mind that even if even if we did use kerosene for that fuel and emitted carbon dioxide, that would counteract a very much larger amount compared to the carbon dioxide that we are, if you like, um, in, uh, you know, um, emitting in terms of as, as a greenhouse gas. In other words, seven and a half tons of sulfur dioxide can, at least in terms of radiative forcing, counteract um, perhaps seven and a half thousand tons, roughly speaking, of um, carbon dioxide, which is very much greater than the, any carbon dioxide that will be emitted by the rocket fuel itself in this example. But clearly, this rocket by itself would not do the job we would need millions of t rockets like this. We said at the beginning of the lecture we're going to need millions of tons of sulfur dioxide if indeed we wanted to go in for this uh, type of exercise, but this is all about the feasibility of it in principle. Um, that whether we'd actually want to do this is, is a different question. But if we did decide to do it, we'd probably need millions of rockets like this or much bigger rockets. So either way, it's going to be a very, very large engineering project. So let's conclude by summarising what we've learned today uh, in all three parts of the lecture. We set out to learn how to design a rocket for lifting large amounts of material onto the stratosphere. We broke the lesson down into three steps. Let's summarise what we learnt in each of these steps. In the first part of the lecture, we highlighted the importance of specific impulse as a key parameter in rocket design. Large specific impulse implies, like, implies large thrust acting for a long time, with relatively small mass of propellant needed to achieve it. We saw that specific impulse has two components, one of momentum and one of pressure. The momentum component is usually the larger of the two, or much larger. The momentum refers to the momentum of the propellants ejected from the nozzle, thus creating a reaction of force. For the momentum component of the impulse to be large, the velocity of the exiting propellant gas should be as large as possible too. In fact, it should ideally be supersonic. We explain that to obtain such supersonic flow, a convergent-divergent nozzle is used, and we obtained expressions for the variation of velocity and area along such a nozzle. An example calculation enables us to calculate specific, specific impulse for given gas properties and nozzle area. In the next part of the lecture, we compare different fuels. We saw that as regards specific impulse, only two parameters really matter in the choice of fuel, the combustion temperature and the molecular mass of the products. The combustion temperature should be as high as possible and the molecular mass should be as low as possible. Using a number of fuels and oxidants, values of specific impulse of over 2000 meters per second are readily achievable, as our calculation showed. But other parameters are also important when it comes to choosing a rocket fuel. For example, ease of liquefaction, safety and environmental considerations. Altogether, kerosene is quite a convenient choice of fuel, for example. In the last part of the lecture, we calculated the flight range and time for an example rocket carrying a payload of, strat of sulfur dioxide to do this, we solve differential equations of motion based on Newton's second law. We confirm that it is indeed possible to design rockets to launch sulfur compounds into the atmosphere and so accomplish the overall aim of the session. The number of and size of rockets required is, however, daunting. But the same could be say for, said for many measures and many proposals that are put forward in order to combat climate change. So all this seems potentially feasible, but is it really a good idea? Would we really want to have to fire millions of rockets each year to protect ourselves against climate change? There must be some risks. For example, perhaps it will cause acid rain as sulfur dioxide tends to convert to sulfuric acid. There also may be effects on the ozone layer. We will discuss some of these effects next time. To help weigh up such effects, we'll be introducing life cycle assessment, which is a useful tool for evaluating the environmental impacts and benefits of engineering designs in general.